All right, I'm Jeff Henderson, and I created Fantasy Football War. I'm a writer for Dynasty Nerds, and I also write a comedic sports analytics blog called Stathole Sports. So um, I'm doing a video explanation on my updated version of War because there's a lot going on, and I think the best way to understand a concept like this is through a visualization. Um, and to be honest, aside from one or two formulas, nothing really mathematical going on here is um, outside of like a middle school level. So uh, it, basically, this is all something a junior high kid could have created, but um, no one ever did, so shame on them. Um, so, quick plug here, you can check me out on Twitter at Stathole Sports and visit, um, visit my blog. I've got a couple of pinned posts if you want to check out to see if you like it. One is on um, NFL receivers who have hogged the most percentage of receiving yards in a game. Uh, another on some dude in the NBA who somehow missed 35 shots in a row out of 88 career attempts. Um, and another one advocating for bums in the NBA to get more opportunities in clutch time. So uh, check them out if you like them. I've got more, but those are probably the better ones, if I'm being honest. So anyway, back to it. Um, I wrote about wins above replacement for fantasy football uh, a year ago and kind of introed the concept. Uh, if you've heard of VORP, uh, value over replacement player. It's a very similar concept going on here. There's just um, a lot more detail, and at the end of the day, you're getting a figure of how many uh, fantasy football wins your team is going to get solely based on one player versus a you know a fill-in scrub replacement level type guy. Uh, and obviously, we'll go through the details with that. Um, comparing players in fantasy is challenging because of the positions involved. You know, quarterbacks score the most, the most points, as we all know, but they're pretty devalued because there's a lot of them that are able to give you those points. So there's a saturated market of quarterbacks, and this is why you see many people go to a 2QB league, which then, you know, um, makes the position more scarce and makes quarterback more valuable. So scarcity differences are, um, you know, a, a big part of what war is going to be able to look into to be able to compare um, apples and oranges. So, you know, wide receivers to running backs or uh, quarterbacks, etc. Um, war figures out what the most likely replacement level player at each position is likely to produce so you can get an an idea of how much more value you know, any player is going to give you than a replacement. So that's kind of how we're standardizing, you know, um, all of the positions together so that we can rank them. So kind of what, uh, what I did here is last year, I was pretty much stuck presuming that top scoring players at, um, at the end of the season were the ones that uh, fantasy managers were using, you know, pretty much every week. And um, it was pretty much just because that was the best data I had to go off of. Um, so that's why I spent the entire 2020 season every week uh, pulling start roster data from ESPN uh, in order to, you know, use a better metric. So that's the concept of war, and when I rolled this out last year, it got a lot of good feedback online. Fantasy analyst Scott Barrett um, showed me a lot of love, and I even got a follow from Matthew Berry, uh, which was cool, so I had to slide to get his thoughts on what he thought of it. Um, he seemed pretty excited about it. Uh, checked in after about a month to see if he had a chance to read it, and... Uh, okay, well, you know what? Matthew Berry is a pretty busy guy. I get it. So... He was really waiting for the version 2.0 here. So the difference between version 2.0 and last year is that now I um, have actual start and roster percent data for every player um, in every week. Before last year, I was stuck just presuming that top scoring players at the end of the season occupied all of the top fantasy lineups. Um, 
when, you know, constructing the map behind the model. But in reality, that's not quite the case. And so that's why I spent 2020 manually pulling start and roster data um, provided by ESPN. So ESPN, you can pretty much pull each week how uh, me- what percentage of leagues each player is either rostered in or started in. Uh, so it's, you know, very helpful. So I'll give you a, a little example of what I mean here. Uh, columns I and J show the start and roster percent uh, data here in these examples. Um, but it wasn't just the top started guys either here. Each week has names from the bottom of the barrel too. Uh, so if you notice here, even by week four, there were some truthers out there holding out hope for players like Andrew Luck to bring them fantasy glory. Um, I don't know, guys. Maybe in 2021. Anyway, uh, yeah, start and roster percent data is is really great because it accounts for uh, bye weeks, injury, streaming, really any other shenanigans common in fantasy football, uh, psychological factors that you know might dictate whether a player is started or or not. Um, I mean, it's really the perfect data for a project like this. Understanding replacement theory is important, but I'll try to be quick here. So I'm using 12-team leagues with your standard starting nine um, roster spots, as shown here. Uh, And we're going to use half-point PPR. So um, just to kind of make it for, you know, relatable to everyone, that's kind of the more common um, scoring format. Or, you know, if you play in a setting that differs slightly, uh, the end result's probably not going to be too far off. But... um, For this demo, we're going to focus on the running back position um, because, you know, the way that I explain how everything works for running back is going to be the same for all the other positions. Uh, Yeah, so here we've got what would look like a 12-team starting roster slate, and uh, we're going to fill these in with some of the top-named running backs, probably from, you know, either earlier in the year, I don't know, somewhere in the year. I just kind of picked them. But the idea is these would be the running backs that were the top 24 started in a given week. So um, really what we need to think about is what happens when, you know, one of them has a bye or they get injured or maybe turns out to be Le'Veon Bell. Whatever it is, you're going to have to go to your bench. Now, you could have any number of backups pending league rules on your bench and so could any of the other teams. But the replacement is going to be the best guy you've got available. So um, what we need to do is figure out how to best estimate what that would be. So uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Each team in a 12-team league theoretically holds one of the top 12 backs left after the starters fill the league slots. And um, for running back as well as wide receiver tight end, we'll need to take flex into account too, which we'll do in just a moment. But anyway, since we don't know which team uh, has the best bench replacement, we're just going to average the top 12 um, running backs for all 16 weeks in terms of start percentage after, um, you know, the starters. So um, we'll get a little bit more into that soon, make a little bit more sense with an example. Anyway, the resulting figure is going to give the points that we can expect from a replacement at the RB position. And again, we're going to do this pretty much the same way for um, the other positions as well. One more thing before moving on, we need to make a slight adjustment here. So we know the top 24 running backs fill the league starting roster spots for each week, or at least uh, theoretically here. The same works for wide receivers and then the top 12 for tight end. Uh, We need to account for our flex spot here. So in the flex, you can use a running back, a wide receiver, or a tight end. So we need to remove any running back that from a replacement pool that would be considered a flexed running back. And the way to do that is to uh, remove the top 24 running backs from consideration, kind of like we did before, and then do the same thing with wide receivers, and then the same thing for t- uh, tight end, only that would be the top 12 after we remove the top 24 or 12 started players for each week, the next 
top 12 combination of those positions would be considered your league flexes. Um, and those would not be able to be considered for replacement. For running back, and then, you know, the same works for the other positions as well. Uh, one thing that's really cool about this is that the the amount of players for each position is totally dependent on how often they were started, right? So a flex tight end is a lot more rare than either the wide receiver or running back, which kind of took up the majority of flex spots in the league for each week. Uh, and that makes sense because most backup tight ends suck, so teams are more likely to find a wide receiver or a running back to fill that role. All right, so let's play this out, how this works for running back. Um, the top 12 started backs, after we account for any starting running back, whether it be in a running back spot or a flex spot, the next top 12 starting running backs in ESPN leagues are considered um, the replacement running backs for each week. And we figure out who those players are for all 16 weeks. And that gives us these 192 orange RB outputs um, here. And really what we do is we just average all that together uh, to give us what we expect out of a replacement level running back in 2020. So let's go ahead and take a look at the actual names for these replacement level running backs and how they did. So you'll notice here that, um, you know, th these aren't in perfect order, but in any case, you can kind of tell that there's a wide range of outcomes here as far as points go for the top of the line replacement backs versus the scrub of the scrub replacement backs, right? Um, so you don't really know exactly what to expect, which is why taking the mean is kind of the you know, the best estimate here. And so that's what we do. With replacement theory out of the way, the next step in the process is to isolate a single player and answer the question, what are the odds of winning a weekly matchup based on one player only? I'm going to use championship hero Alvin Kamara as an example here. Um, so on the left, we have our opponent. And on the right, we have our team with Kamara. And we're going to figure out what the odds are of winning our matchup. So we need to figure out first what to expect out of our opponent, and to do this, we take the average of the top starting league players from each position across the year. So for running back and wide receiver, this means the top 24 started players and then the top 12 for the rest. Um, but again, we do need to account for flex, and it turns out this is pretty easy. We just remove any running back, receiver, or tight end who would be considered a starter, assuming they'd fill their native positions, and consider the next top 12 started combination of them to be league flexes for each week, and then again average it in the same way. All in all, the average opponent scores 112 points um, in a week, and you'll notice that we transfer all of these score averages to our team except for Kamara, so he can be properly isolated and we can figure out what his contribution to our team was in terms of win percentage. Now, here's a quick glance of each of Kamara's weekly outputs that gets plugged into this spot iteratively. For this demo, we're just going to focus on week one and calculate the odds fantasy teams won starting him with 21.2 points. So now we need to find the expected points of our team, and we do this by subtracting the average running back, not to be confused with replacement, from Kamara's 21.2 points, and then we need to add back the score of an average team. And this gives us our expected score with Alvin Kamara for week one, which is 120.1 versus an average rando team with 112.43. This is where things get a little more mathy. We need to figure out the odds that 120 points will beat Team Rando, but to do that, we need to know the standard deviation of Team Rando. Now, that turns out to be 21.62. Um, to get this, we use the same data that went into our average score calculations for each position, only this time we find the standard deviation, and then we plug those into the square root of the sum of squares formula, giving us our answer. 
Um, and then from there, now we're ready to answer the question of, the you know, what are the odds Kamara's team with 120.1 will beat a team scoring 112.43 and with a standard deviation of 21.62. So using central limit theorem and probability distributions and things that you forgot about since eighth grade, you get 64%. We did all that work, we just do it all over again for weeks 2 through 16. You'll notice in week 6, though, we plug in the points expected out of a replacement running back as a fill-in for Kamara's bye week. This is done not only for bye weeks, though, but for any game missed due to injury, suspension, COVID, whatever. This is how war accounts for games missed, and um, if you think about it, if you lose a star player, you're going to be left to the bench to find the best available fill-in. And if you're a player that missed a lot of games, you do need to be penalized for it. This brings me to pivot from Alvin Kamara to another example I want to walk you through, Christian McCaffrey. Now that we know how to estimate weekly win percentages, I just went ahead and inserted all 16 from McCaffrey to continue on with the demo. You'll notice that the three games that he played are in orange and the rest are in gray, uh, representing the 39.5% uh, chance a replacement level running back would have provided your team. Now, I didn't follow through all the way on Alvin Kamara to get his final 2020 war, um, but we're going to do so here for McCaffrey. So, the first thing we need to do is calculate his combined win percent for all 16 games. And we simply take the average of the three games he played times three plus the 13 games. Um, from a replacement level player, which you were forced to play while he was either on bye or out on injury. This turns out to be 7.33 out of 16 games won. So the question is, how much better is 7.33 than the replacement level running back? Well, we simply multiply the win percentage for a replacement level times 16 total games in a fantasy season, and subtract that from McCaffrey's 7.33, and voila. We get Christian McCaffrey's 2020 war value for half-point PPR, 1.01. One win more than a replacement. I mean, for three games, though, that's actually not too bad, and it makes me wonder what could have been had McCaffrey stayed healthy. Well, since injuries are random, we might not expect McCaffrey to be injured in 2021 and instead choose to estimate his war solely based on the games that he played and not penalize him for the games missed. So here I have all three outputs along with the points that you'd expect from a replacement level running back for the other games. Now, for many players, this would be irresponsible to do with such a small sample size, but Given how dominant McCaffrey was in 2019 and the three games that he played in 2020, I don't think it's too unfair to prorate his war. Um, and that would take his 1.01 figure and balloon it to a 5.43 wins above replacement. Okay, that's it. Class is over. And now comes the fun part. Want to see how this all turned out? <laughs> 